I want to thank you all for allowing me the privilege of speaking on the day after Dr. King's 85th birthday. Uh, it's a great honor uh, to be in your presence. Uh, in two days, of course, we are going to send off Amiri Baraka, who is another giant of our people's movement. I watched uh, Brother Ham and other guests in a roundtable discussion of Amiri Baraka's life and times on Democracy Now! And I know it was obligatory that everybody else here watched it too. And I have to say that this was the best episode of that program ever, and it may be the most enriching, informative television that I have ever seen. And that includes the four years that I hosted a national, nationally syndicated talk show. And what I thought was so valuable about that discussion was that it examined Baraka's whole life, uh, his development as a political person. Brother Ham and everybody else uh, on that panel were very clear that the changes of Leroy Jones, Amiri Baraka, the changes that he went through politically were not the product of his own uh, personal idiosyncrasies or mood swings. They were the product of changing times and the changing perspectives of our people and the changing perspectives of people around the world. Uh, people seeing their place in the world differently as time moved on. There was a logic to the changing politics of Amiri Baraka. There was an attempt to get in sync with the logic of history as it unfolds and to make sense of the world and what else can we expect from a person, especially a person who is in leadership. So who was the real Amiri Baraka? The answer is, they were all real. The guy who, hang, who hung out with beatniks was real. The apolitical poet was real. The cultural nationalist was real. The pan-Africanist was real. The communist was real. And the Obama supporter was real. All of them were real, and all of them will be laid to rest on Saturday in the same casket. They were all reflections of the same man at different times under different circumstances. Because you can't just snatch a piece of a person's life and say that that piece is the real authentic person. If you do, then you are killing off the rest of that person. It's the same way, I believe, with Dr. Martin Luther King. Only with Dr. Martin Luther King, powerful forces, both black and white, have attempted to kill off Dr. King, and certainly uh, in the period of time that he lived after 1963. It is as if they are assassinating the post-1963 Dr. King. They want to freeze him in time at the time of the March on Washington and bury the next five years of his life. They want to kill him at age 34, when he wasn't even dead until age 39. And that is a crime against truth. And since he was our leader, it's a crime against our people. It is, as I said, a kind of assassination. So they want to assassinate him twice. They make the I have a dream speech his epitaph, and they make it the end of the story, even though the brother kept on moving and growing and agitating for another five years. We need to rectify that. We need to take back those five years. We need to give those five years back to Dr. King. Certainly, every January, we need to give Dr. King his last five years, and we need to set the record straight on the years that came before 1963. And we don't talk much about them except regarding Montgomery. And that's going to be the subject of my talk tonight, basically the years before the March on Washington. 
Most of us know, of course, about the Montgomery bus boycott of 1955. Certainly you guys know, after all that marching that you did, to break the record of the Montgomery bus boycott. And most people are familiar with the Birmingham campaign of 1963, which was followed that year by the March on Washington. But what happened with Dr. King in the years between 1955, the bus boycott, and 1963 is a blur to most people. And I think it's probably a blur of some kind to most of us in this room. So I want to direct you to the year 1957. It was a very, very important year for black people, and it was a very important year for Dr. King. That was the year that the Southern Christian Leadership Conference was founded. That was in January of 1957. The idea for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference or some kind of organization that looked like the Southern Christian Leadership Conference came from Bayard Rustin. Baird Rustin was a socialist and a pacifist and a labor activist and a very gay man. Uh, and he was, he was one of the organizers of the first freedom rides on interstate buses. And that was back in 1947. Dr. King, uh, at the suggestion of Baird Rustin, by the way, uh, convened a meeting of about 60 ministers at the Ebenezer uh, Baptist Church in Atlanta. Uh, where his father was the pastor, and I believe he was co-pastor at that time in 57. And then they held another meeting in New Orleans, and then the SCLC was born. It was a formation of relatively militant ministers, relatively militant voices within the black church, but it was not the black church. It did not speak for the black church. Certainly, it did not speak for the National Baptist Convention, which was overwhelmingly comprised of accommodationist uh, preachers. The, those preachers were largely silent on social issues, or they competed with each other uh, as to be as to how, who would be the go-to person between the white establishment in their cities uh, and black people. Uh, this. This really was uh, the profile of the real black church, by and large. In contrast, uh, the ministers who came together in the SCLC were, and I call them this, renegades. They were the radical rump of the black church in the South. They were relatively few in number. We have to understand the SCLC's relationship to the rest of the black church or we get history wrong. The bulk of the black clergy in the South were neutral or even hostile to activism. And that would become very clear in the first years of the SCLC. The SCLC, it should be remembered, was not a general membership organization. You couldn't just walk up and say, I want to be in the SCLC. It wasn't that kind of group. It was made up of organizations. Mostly, it was made up of congregations with a minister in charge, uh, plus some community groups. Mainly, however, it was run by preachers. This would prove to be both a strength and a weakness of the SCLC. The strength was that the preachers brought their congregations with them, so there was a certain certain number, certain membership, a certain uh, uh, critical mass uh, built in. Uh, also, uh, the preachers, of course, lived off their congregations, and therefore, uh, these preachers were uh, somewhat economically independent. Uh, they could, within the parameters set by their congregations, uh, speak their own minds and make their own decisions. They were somewhat, if their congregations let them, uh, insulated from the pressures of white society. The weakness in having an organization that was made up of preachers was that preachers felt bound by the protocols and by the etiquette of the black church. And that meant that you didn't go into a city 
and set up operations for some kind of movement campaign unless at least one local congregation invited you into that city. And at the time, in 1957 and years thereafter, almost everywhere in the Deep South, local black ministers didn't want anything to do with the SCLC. Therefore, as it turned out, the black church actually circumscribed, limited the capacity of Dr. King and the SCLC uh, to move about in the South. They limited it simply by shutting their doors and not giving them a berth in the cities that they would have liked to go into. These black accommodationist uh, preachers were just as adamant as the local white people were about keeping out outside agitators like Dr. King. They would say things like, we can handle our affairs ourselves. Uh, we're working things out with our white people. And you can hear the mirror image voice coming from the white people. We can work it out with our Negroes. It was a, a closed and unholy circle. That's why, until the hugely successful campaign in Birmingham in early 1963, the SCLC was engaged in only one direct action campaign, and that was in 1962 in Albany, Georgia. And there was already a movement going on in Albany. Uh, uh, protests were being uh, carried out by organizations like the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and the NAACP. And that was already in motion, and Dr. King uh, became involved with that. Uh, so how did Dr. King bring a quarter million people to Washington in 1963? when his activities were so circumscribed even in his home territory of the Deep South. Well, lots of things occurred before he was allowed uh, or was able uh, to bring a quarter million people to D.C. What most people don't know is that 1963 was actually the second March on Washington led by Dr. King. The first one happened right after the founding of the SCLC in 1957, uh, right after they uh, finished their business of forming the organization uh, in New Orleans, they decided to have what in effect was a march on Washington. On May 17th of that year, somewhere between 15 and 20,000 people gathered at the Lincoln Memorial in Washington for what they called a, a prayer pilgrimage for freedom. It was much the same cast of characters that would gather in the same place six years later. There was Baird Rustin, whose idea uh, the SCLC was. There was Dr. King. There was Roy Wilkins. Uh, A. Philip Randolph was there. He had wanted the event to be like the March on Washington that he had threatened to have in 1941. Uh, but he got overruled. Harry Belafonte was there. Mahalia Jackson sang. Dr. King was the big hit of the show. He gave a speech that was titled, Give Us the Ballot. Sounds very much like 1963. 1963 was really the fulfillment of 1957 with almost the same cast. The Amsterdam News wrote that Dr. King was now the top Negro leader in America. And that made Roy Wilkins very angry. So Roy Wilkins wrote to the newspaper to tell them that that was wrong. Dr. King was not the top Negro. That also lets you know that the black press back in 1957 uh, was taken very seriously, at least by black people back in those days. But again, only 15 or 20,000 people arrived at the Lincoln Memorial back in 57. That means the movement had not hit its stride. It also showed that 60 renegade militant preachers and their friends could not yet draw the kind of crowd that would shake the system. Obviously, the system was not shaken. That's why most of you never heard of the 1957 March on Washington. All this, of course, would change later on in 1957 because that is when 
Little Rock happened. Now, I know everybody here knows about Little Rock. Everybody's seen the pictures of the children. Uh, it's, it's something that's in, embedded in our mind. But I don't think that most people understand the real political significance of Little Rock. It's not just an integration story. It is a really important point in the dynamic of the whole black movement. Most people think of Birmingham in 1963 with all those dogs and the, the, the water hoses. They think of that as the great media event uh, of the movement. But before Birmingham, there was Little Rock. It happened only a few months after the SCLC's prayer pilgrimage to Washington, the one that got 15 or 20,000 people. In Little Rock, literally thousands of white people, many of them women, appeared on national television. And remember, this is 1957. Television is very young. Television news is very new. And so this is a new kind of phenomenon. And what do people see on their television? They see thousands of crazy white people, including a whole bunch of women spitting and cursing and screaming. Their eyes are full of hate. Their mouths are full of profanity. It was a lynch mob. Anyone could, could see immediately and identify that is a lynch mob. They want to lynch somebody. Now, people had heard of lynch mobs before, but this was the first time that anybody had actually seen one on national television. And it wasn't just Americans who were watching that television. The world, the world saw the United States and its racism in the raw, in all of its obscene ugliness. And it was a spectacle. And there was President Eisenhower trying to convince the emerging nations of Africa and Asia that the U.S. was the best bet in the fight against communism. And here were these rednecks on television in Little Rock showing the world what the United States was really like. We have to understand that President Eisenhower himself was a segregationist. When he was the top general, the head of the US Armed Forces, he was opposed to integration of the armed forces. That is not a secret. As president, he refused to take a stand against school desegregation. Uh, uh, he refused to put the government on the side of the 1954 Supreme Court decision. And in fact, that was the reason that the pilgrimage to Washington in 1957 was called. It was called as a protest against Eisenhower's refusal uh, to do or say anything about the 1954 decision, which had not yet desegregated much of anything. <clears throat> Eisenhower didn't give a damn about black people, but he was embarrassed for his country by the behavior of those white people in Little Rock. And so he did what was unthinkable at the time. For the first time since federal troops were withdrawn from the South in 1877, Eisenhower sent in US soldiers to protect black children in Arkansas. Black folks, especially down South, went crazy about Eisenhower. Now, I was only seven years old, but I remember all of the adults talking about, oh, Ike did the right thing. Oh, I like Ike. Ike was very popular. I didn't even know who Ike was, but I knew that people liked him. He must have done the right thing. It also has to be remembered, we tend to forget, that about 25% of black folks were Republicans at the time. They were still loyal to the party of Lincoln. It was the Democrats that were the white man's party in the South. And so-called liberals like Adlai Stevenson, who ran for president on the Democratic ticket in 1952 and 1956, would not say anything that would piss off the Southern 
wing of the Democratic Party. You have to remember that Strom Thurmond and other Dixiecrats had pulled out of the party and run a separate ticket for president in 1948, and the Democrats did not want a repeat of that. They didn't want the Dixiecrats to jump ship again. And here was a Republican president sending U.S. troops to be on the side of black folks in the South. That was a political game changer. As the 1960 elections drew nearer, everybody knew it was going to be a very tight race. The Democrats were very, very worried. Eisenhower was riding high among the blacks, and the Democrats feared that his vice president, Richard Nixon, would inherit Ike's goodwill among black people at election time. Now, I know that you find this difficult to imagine today that Nixon could possibly, anybody would think that Nixon was going to be attractive to black people. But it was uh, totally a possibility back in the day because of Ike's uh, phenomenal popularity for sending in the troops, something that no other US president had done in 80 years. And that's why, for the first time in the 20th century, the Republicans and the Democrats were both actively campaigning for the black vote in 1960. That had not happened before either. And that's why less than two weeks before the election, Senator John Kennedy called Coretta King to express his concern about Dr. King, who was in jail and he was facing potential hard time in Georgia. Kennedy didn't do that because he gave a damn about the civil rights movement. Throughout his presidency, he and Bobby Kennedy were furious with the movement for threatening to split the Southern white Democrats from the rest of the party. This was their abiding concern. Kennedy did it. He made that call because the election of 1960 was a razor's edge, and it was a razor's edge toss-up because of Little Rock. Little Rock changed the political environment. Little Rock made the Democrats and Republicans compete for black votes. Little Rock forced black people into national politics like they had never been before, so that the United States would not look like the Ku Klux Klan country to the rest of the world. That's how it happened, and it had nothing to do with the changing heart of the Kennedys. The competition that was set off by Little Rock between the two parties is what got Dr. King and the rest of Negro leadership in as regular visitors to the White House. Suddenly, we were very important. And that kind of high profile made Dr. King and Dr. King's associates' activities an item that the corporate media found worthy of coverage because black people were not considered worthy of coverage under any circumstances before. Remember the book, The Invisible Man, that applied to all of us, invisible to their cameras, but no more. It wasn't just the Amsterdam News anymore, like back in 1957. Uh, and, the, and that first march on Washington. So when Birmingham gets going, and that's early in 1963, the TV cameras are there. And when Police Commissioner Bull Connor uh, falls right into the trap that the SCLC had set for him, acting like a racist dog with his police canines and fire hoses and locking up children, those cameras were there. And now we get to August 1963. That's only a few months after that phenomenal coverage of Birmingham. We're back, we're back on the news almost every night uh, during that period. Even Larry Hamm was old enough to remember that. <laughs> Much the same people uh, arrive at the Lincoln Memorial as, as in 1957. John Lewis is a new one. 
He's there because there is now a SNCC. SNCC came into existence in 1960. It essentially grows out of, of the sit-in movements, and SNCC is now a force. Nevertheless, the organizers of the 63 March uh, decided they were going to censor John Lewis so that he wouldn't embarrass President Kennedy. Just like they censored A. Philip Randolph in 1957 so that he wouldn't embarrass President Eisenhower. So things had not changed that much among the cast of characters, but there was something new added besides SNCC, and that was Malcolm. And Malcolm was there, or rather he was everywhere on, in the media, because all black folks were getting in the media now. They got a taste of us, all right? And so even Malcolm uh, was, getting, was getting play. And Malcolm was throwing bricks from the peanut gallery. Uh, he was talking about the big six. The big six uh, was the SCLC, SNCC, uh, CORE, the NAACP, the Urban League, and somebody out, near, out there knows what the sixth one was. Uh, but he was calling them names and talking about, no, I got the Urban League, talking about self-determination. And so even though Time Magazine was saying now that Dr. King was really the top Negro leader, there were new forces in black America who were trying to prove otherwise. The focus of the 1963 March on Washington was voting rights. That was also the focus of the 1957 March on Washington. But not too long later, uh, in 1965, the Voting's right, Voting Rights Act had been passed. And in fact, virtually the entire legislative civil rights agenda had been passed. There was only one item remaining, and that was the uh, Fair Housing Act. And that was passed the week after uh, Dr. King was assassinated. But by 1965, uh, basically the legislative agenda of the civil rights movement, uh, the bills that people had been demanding, they were all in effect. Yet, in 1965, there were 10 thousand demonstrations. Most of those demonstrations, that's what Julian Bond says, so you can call him a lie. 10,000, and most of them were not conventional civil rights demonstrations, that is saying give us the vote or integrate uh, the buses or, or things like that. They were demonstrations against the conditions of American life. They weren't even about the war. Because by 1965, uh, most white folks were still not talking about the war. Many of our folks were talking about the war. SNCC actually advanced uh, the anti-war cause uh, much, uh, much earlier uh, on. And by 66, I believe it is, we got Muhammad Ali talking about ain't no Viet Cong ever called me nigger, you see. Uh, but 65, no, there was not much of a war or anti-war movement. So those 10,000 uh, demonstrations, there were more demonstrations than any other year in U.S. history, were mostly about the conditions of life, about social uh, issues uh, in the United States, and of course about police brutality. So in a way, one can say that the civil rights era was over, at least as 1965 uh, closed out. People were now talking about the meaning of freedom. What does it mean uh, to be free? People were talking about power and the transformation of society. One could say that the 1963 March on Washington was the last big civil rights event. It was certainly the last of two marches on Washington. Most of the rest of the 60s, and when we say 60s, we really mean into the 70s, as you guys were talking about on that panel discussion. Most of the 60s is about changing the structures of U.S. society and about U.S. imperialism. Dr. King was also shifting gears after 1965. He knew that he had accomplished, uh, along with, of course, uh, millions of other people, a miracle. But the miracle was done, and uh, now you have to move on uh, to other business. And he was talking about where do we go from here. It's not like Dr. King was a fish out of water, that he was so uh, fixated 
on conventional civil rights that he didn't know what to do with himself after 1965 when so many of the battles uh, were won. I, I want to read you something that he said in 1959. Now this is four years before the 63 March and he's talking about his dream 1959. I dream of a land where men will not take necessities from the many to give luxuries to a few, where all our gifts and resources are held not for ourselves alone, but as instruments of service to the rest of humanity. That sounds like an anti-capitalist dream uh, to me. So, so it was not uh, after 1965 that King didn't know what to do with himself. Uh, how to do it, well, that's something we were all uh, trying to figure out. But his dream was of a just society. Four years before his civil rights, I have a dream speech. He was focused on that dream of social justice and peace until April 4th, 1968. And he cared so much for that dream of social justice and peace that he broke with the president who had signed most of those civil rights bills. Powerful white people and the black people who serve those powerful white people want to stop Dr. King's clock in August of 1963. That's because the last years of his life were taken up with the movement's unfinished business, the business of social transformation and peace and it's still unfinished business. They don't want us to finish that business. That's why they kill Dr. King off at the age of 34. But because of people like you, people in pop, the agenda is, will be kept alive. And for that reason, I'm more proud of you than you can imagine. Power to the people. You don't ask me questions. I, I lost my bar. Okay. You want to ask uh, Brother Ford any questions? Anybody? Yes. Daniel. Yes. Now, uh, when they were forming the SNCC, they were 1960? SNCC? Yes. Okay. So the, what, what was the, uh, the uh, uh, SLC? Well, a lot of people in the SCLC had some ideas about what SNCC was and was going to be that were not shared uh, by the young people in SNCC. Uh, the SCLC tended to envision SNCC as being a kind of a youth SCLC. Remember, uh, these, these are our ministers. Basically, it's dominated by preachers. And here, these uh, are these young people? What are, what are they going to do? Uh, SNCC got uh, a a great deal of support uh, from Ella Baker, uh, who for a long time <laughs> was the only employee of the SCLC, and so she ran the show. and And uh, uh, she was of like mind, although she was in her fifties by by that time. She was older than Dr. King and uh, many of those ministers. Uh, but she dealt directly uh, with the kids, as people sometimes called them, uh, and uh, gave them access to whatever facili uh, facilities, and, and facilities aren't just, just physical things, connections, et cetera, uh, advice, uh, the, the whole facilities in, in the larger sense of the word. Uh, and so people, people because uh, uh, SNCC was getting uh, such uh, support and nourishment uh, uh, from, from the SCLC, uh, folks outside and in the SCLC assumed that they would act, if not in name, in practice, like a youth uh, branch of the SCLC. But that was not to be, because these young people had uh, ideas uh, of their own. Uh, and uh, far from becoming a youth branch of the SCLC, uh, they became uh, the agitators uh, who kept on not for at first nudging and, and at some at, at sometimes uh, and some of their personalities uh, denouncing 
what they considered uh, to be uh, 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 oh, the lack of militancy uh, uh, within the SCLC. And in a very, very short period of time, although in the 60s, uh, during that period, uh, everything seemed to go faster and, and speed it up. But in a very short period of time, uh, you see the H. Rap Browns and uh, Stokely Carmichael's uh, emerging. Well, they came from SNCC. So SNCC not, not only uh, uh, spun off people like Julian Bond, uh, but also people like Stokely uh, Carmichael. Uh, 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 so, so it, SNCC did not fulfill the expectations of SCLC. It outgrew the uh, limited expectations of the SCLC. In, uh, in 1965, that uh, Martin Luther King and uh, Muhammad Ali having that spoke on the war in 1965. But I, I, I could have sworn that Malcolm X was speaking about going overseas and fighting a war when you got war here against us. You know, I'm sure that Malcolm X has spoken first about that way before 1965. Oh, of course he did. Of course he did. Oh, okay. Because I just, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I just remember, you know, he was the first one who spoke on it because he didn't, he didn't care about what the government felt about him. You know, so that's all I have to say. Yes, Malcolm X had a, a, a tape called Message of Grassroots Part 4, and he had a lot of strong opinions that local leaders had uh, had started it, and that they was going to go on the runway, lay it up on the runway. And what I know about that speech is that King, led by the Big Six, was was given that to try to cool cool it down. I heard it was a, was a controlled show, get out before sundown. You know, that they have white clowns and black clowns and that uh, uh, it was used as coffee. When you have coffee, you want wheat, then you integrate. They didn't integrate it to his knowledge. They infiltrated, took it over. And, you know, and also, it wasn't really a dream speech. It was like, uh, it was a conclusion, but it was an indictment against the in, uh, uh, inequalities of uh, economic uh, wealth. How true is that? You know, was it a control show? And, uh, Oh yeah, it was a controlled show in terms of get out of town by sundown and, and all the logistics uh, of it, and it was massive logistics to get a, move a quarter million people, were made much more complicated by the fact that everybody uh, had to get out of town. That was by agreement with the White House. Uh, the, uh, the entire affair uh, was negotiated uh, with the, the White House. Uh, the White House actually put uh, the city under a, a kind of, of martial law. Technically, they were un, under martial uh, law. Uh, the, the organizers of the march, uh, in their cooperation with the White House, were genuinely uh, afraid uh, that some of us uh, might act a fool <laughs> and mar uh, the occasion. Uh, because they wanted it to be choreographed as uh, peaceful Negroes and, and their white friends uh, coming in uh, uh, to uh, have a, a, a peaceful and joyous and, and loving day. And, uh, you know, real people can mess up that mood. So when, when, it, when we say that it was orchestrated uh, in collaboration with the White House, it was not necessarily uh, something that was forced on the organizers uh, of of the event uh, that 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 is uh, my impression and it's an impression based based upon uh, all kinds of quotes from the the people involved uh, was that most of the organizers were just as concerned <laughs> as the president and the police uh, in Washington uh, that there might uh, that that if folks didn't get out of town uh, that night the night might mess up the day they really wanted uh, decorum. So I just wanted to make that clear. It, it, it was not necessarily uh, a, a regimen that was imposed uh, totally by the White House on the organizers. They also didn't want any trouble. Ellen. Um, I, I, in lieu of what you're saying, was that you that spoke about the and um, the uh, Riverside, uh, the Riverside Church, um, talking about our current politician and former mayor here. 
uh, at Riverside Church. It was on WBAI this week. Yeah, I just I just recently learned that they played that uh, on BAI. Yeah. Over these years, the last 50 years, we've been trying, working towards self-determination. And Amir Baraka says, unified front. And what I'm saying is about the seeds of deception. Would you talk about um, Cory Booker and the backers? That's, that's what I'm saying. You know, of course, as we go forward, we want to know what to look for. You know, I, w I was... Cory Booker and his backers surprised me. I, I was working for a small black uh, newspaper in uh, 2001, and so I knew uh, of Cory Booker. Uh, I, I saw him, you know, at council meetings. Uh, I saw that, that most people on the council didn't seem to be afraid of him and paid him very little attention. Uh, I knew that he had held his political national coming out party uh, at the Manhattan Institute, uh, which, which is in the uh, division of labor among the right-wing think tanks, the one that specializes in media. And so when, when you have your national coming out uh, party at a power luncheon of the media outlet for the uh, constellation of right-wing organizations, that means that you have arrived and they are advertising you as one of them. Now, I understood uh, all of that, uh, but I, I so just saw it as, as another uh, opportunistic uh, politician. But when Corey uh, announced, uh, his, formally announced his candidacy uh, for mayor uh, early in, in 2002, uh, uh, I went immediately uh, home to look uh, on the uh, on the internet to see what kind of reaction there was uh, among the news media and the political folks, and I was shocked, shocked. Uh, the, the the whole internet was lit up by the whole constellation of of right wing think tanks and funders and organizations. I mean, the enemy was cheering and they were all calling him by his first name go ahead Corey I said damn they all they act like they know him like they own him it was a, a, a really shocking thing I, I I didn't I didn't think that they these racists uh, had reached a a level uh, that that they would uh, uh, make a black person uh, their hero and, and and be exuding such love uh, for this man that was shocking. Uh, the the money that this represented was all was first at first shocking and then then very sobering. So the first thing I did uh, after uh, coming to grips uh, with the fact that Cory Booker represented the corporate right wing and there he is trying to capture City Hall of the quintessential Chocolate City, the first thing I did was to run back uh, to Sharp James. Uh, who was not a friend of mine? Uh, he, he fired my mother when he when he when he came into after the, he defeated uh, Gibson. So of course he wasn't a friend of mine. But this is the enemy. This is the barbarian at the gate. And so I tried to explain uh, to Sharp James uh, that he was going to be massively outspent. That all the resources of the corporate right wing were going to be arrayed against him. And he didn't understand a damn thing I said. He, 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 he just, he, he couldn't comprehend. And, and it, yeah, and, and in fact, when it did translate uh, to him saying something uh, about Corey, uh, he, he, he said that Cory Booker, he associate with the worst white people. Uh, he, he's associating with the Ku Klux Klan. Now everybody know there ain't no, hardly no Ku Klux Klan in New Jersey. So he made himself look ridiculous. And, and I realized uh, that there, that, Nothing had prepared, not just Sharp James, but nothing had prepared our political class for an attack f from the right with this kind of money. And it became very clear uh, how vulnerable are fragile political structures, which came about, you know, uh, from 1972 or so on after uh, 
uh, we by default uh, got hold uh, to the keys to City Hall and all these various cities, that we were not ready to go up against a black candidate with millions and millions of dollars behind him. Uh, that that we that that Sharp James uh, 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 was, was not not the exception. Uh, that we were in for a real whipping. Mm. Now that now that rich white folks had decided that they were going to actually control uh, politicians, democratic politicians uh, in the ghetto, that that everything had changed, uh, and that's been the reality since then. So, Corey, Corey, we were able, and I take some credit for this, uh, we were able to beat him back uh, in his 2002 uh, bid. Uh, otherwise, he might have been the first Obama. Uh, uh, but there were many Corys ac across, across the country, a and we saw, we, we saw a crumbling of what was left of the black uh, political uh, consensus uh, from this onslaught of money and we ain't recovered or we, d we don't seem even about uh, to recover yet. Carol, uh, why don't you just say a word about the demonstration that took place at Senator Cory Booker's office tonight? Okay. Um, we were there to, um, in opposition to the sanctions bill that Menendez mm. sponsored. Mm. Men Menendez is one of the sponsors and Booker just right followed right along and co-sponsored. It's the sanctions, it's for harsher sanctions on Iran. On Iran. Yeah. So, and this of course is in the midst of uh, uh, the negotiations by the Obama administration uh, for, for peace. And uh, you know, there was this opening, this amazing opening opportunity because of the new president of Iran and the change, the, new, the elections in Iran. And here's Booker and, uh, and mm. Menendez sabotaging the negotiations. So. And, and Booker just come in and he's doing this. Yeah. First, I would just like to uh, thank you for that brilliant presentation. I mean, I lived through a lot of that. And I was very happy that you mentioned something that a lot of us have forgotten about what took place in Little Rock, Arkansas. It was key. I remember it like it was yesterday. And one person among many of our heroes that we seem to have forgotten, was the seem to have forgotten, some of y'all remember her, was a sister by the name of Daisy Bates. Remember her? She was a lightning rod that took place in, the, that, that was the leader of what they used to call the Little Rock Nine. There was a white supremacist down there by the name of John Casper. Some of y'all might not have ever heard of him. But he was like on the other side of the fence. That was agitating the white people. It's interesting what ended his career. They did some research on his background and found out that he had been running around with black women when he was living in Chicago, somewhere up <laughs> north. <laughs> but I'm saying what happened, what took place in Lutbra was, was, was a key step in the overall march, you know, what took place between the 50s and the 60s. And oftentimes we talk about it everywhere, but we don't talk about Little Rock enough. But you can comment on it. <laughs> No, that, that's right. Little Rock is put in a, a little compartment. That's right. Uh, as if it's just another saga in the school desegregation uh, 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 plane, uh, when, when in fact it was a huge leap, a huge leap for, for our movement as, as, as a whole, uh, and set the stage uh, for for, for the kind of, of jockeying by the two political parties that we now take for granted. It, it didn't exist before. Uh, people did not directly address the Negro. People didn't talk to the Negro or about the Negro. I mean, this, 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 all this uh, 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 basically can be, can be uh, tr traced uh, to the 1960. Uh, uh, presidential race, uh, which uh, which which was heavily influenced by the events of Little Rock. Susan, and then Jay, and then Lisa, and then we're gonna wrap it up. Thank you very much for being here. I was listening to WB. A little louder, please. Can you hear me? I was listening to. Thank you very much for being here before. I was listening to WBAI, and they were playing. Um, Martin, Martin Luther King's uh, To America. 
And there were two questions that I wrote down about. I was, I was perplexed. He talked about that white people and black people, we need to get together. He said that the white people need the black people to rip them of their guilt, and black people need the white people so we can, we can be rid of our fears. That's the first question. Number two, he talked about time being neut neut neutrality, because in religion, like, you know, I'm, I'm my religious Pentecostal, and they always talk about, oh, you gotta pray about it, because time is on your side, you gotta pray, and, you know, things of that nature. And he talked about time being neutral. I'd just like for you to comment on this. You know, I, I, I really, really uh, am, am not equipped uh, uh, to deal with Martin Luther King as a philosopher. Uh, uh, I, I could not uh, do him justice, and, and I really would just be speculating uh, on his meeting, and, and I should not do that. I, I really shouldn't. Uh, he, uh, uh, he should not be handled by amateurs like myself. <laughs> Jay. Ford with regard to the lessons we can take from the anti-capitalist struggle of Dr. King for our struggles today, which was an aim of your presentation. Um, you know, I've been accused of always seeing revolution around the corner, uh, but it does seem to be that there's something afloat right now. We've had a, a, a far left socialist one in city council in Seattle, almost in Minneapolis, in uh, Richmond, California, they have uh, a green mayor that's using eminent domain not to throw out poor people, but for uh, uh, poor people to get their homes back from the banks. Um, on the other side, it's in the latest edition of, of Black Agenda Report, Bruce Dixon talks about how uh, the Moral Monday uh, ministers in, in the South are using the, uh, this move to the left to kind of cover for the Democrats. They're opposing what the Republicans are doing, but not exposing what the Democrats are doing, attacking us. And then we have Mayor de Blasio in New York, who ran on a, a, a tale of two cities uh, campaign, uh, really uh, rallied working class people, but then his program now is to serve the one percent. He, this police chief, is he ran against stop and frisk, and the police chief he named is the guy that cooked it all up. He ran against Wall Street, but he surrounded his whole administration with Wall Street. So um, the question I have is, how can we really push forward this anti-capitalist uh, struggle that Dr. King was leading in that last phase of his life? Can the Democratic Party be a, a vehicle to project that agenda? Or do we have to break with the Democrats, as is happening in some of these cities? When we push forward, we must push forward straightforwardly. And that has to be based upon an analysis of who, uh, who is the main enemy and, uh, and an attempt to uh, formulate a strategy about how to bring the main enemy down. That's basically how you work. I think that the main enemy at this stage uh, of the game is finance capital. Uh, that finance capital uh, is exerting, uh, has achieved hegemony uh, that, that is almost untouchable power over U.S. society uh, and all of its uh, institutions. Uh, and also that everybody hates finance capital. Everybody hates the banks. It didn't even take a, 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 an Occupy Wall Street uh, to bring out the hatred of the bank. Everybody hates the bank every, every damn month when you see the fees that they take out of your out of your checks. And, and I, found, I, I found it very perplexing and frustrating that Occupy uh, would, would come up with such effective slogans like the 99%, uh, percent, uh, which if they worked on Madison Avenue should have got them, you know, big, big bonuses. Wonderful slogan. Uh, and, and yet go right up to the cusp of saying we have to break the power of finance capital. Break them. Not break up the banks, but break finance capital, period. Uh, I think that that, that is a 
po potentially popular uh, a political goal uh, that would in fact unify a whole bunch of folks uh, who ain't us. Uh, certainly all those libertarian uh, white folks, they hate the banks too. Uh, and, and yet we are not uh, straightforward uh, enough uh, to, to say actually what needs to be, uh, to be done. If, if that is what needs to be done, then how can, how can we possibly do it in a Democratic Party uh, that is now totally beholden to the bankers? Uh, I used to say 15 years ago uh, that Wall Street is to the Democratic Party what big energy is to the Republican Party. The Republicans could always uh, count on uh, millions and millions of dollars in campaign contributions uh, from big oil and all the extraction industries. And the Democrats have always been able uh, to count on campaign contributions in the millions from Wall Street because almost all of, uh, of finance capital does its business uh, with cities. Uh, where the big projects are, where they always have to uh, float bonds and things like that. And so uh, uh, as, as a necessity, uh, the Wall Streeters uh, maintained, have maintained for decades the tightest of relationships uh, with democratic uh, city and state governments so that they can get uh, the, the business when bonds are floated and such. And so there is this, this unholy uh, alliance between the Democratic Party and the very people who, if we do not overthrow them, will be the death of us. So no, you, the, the salvation uh, is, is not only not in the Democratic Party, uh, we will not break out of our paralysis, this street jacket uh, that stops us uh, from organizing uh, unless we break with the Democratic Party. It is a great sucking machine that sucks all the energy uh, out of our folks. Lisa, you got the last word. First of all, Glenn, it's always great to see you and to hear you. I've been a fan of yours since the Black Commentator, the first edition. Um, and, but I just wanted to say, as you were talking, and you alluded to this somewhat, but I couldn't help but to think about, you know, King and, and the role that so many of the youth, very young children, played in his legacy. And when you were talking about the March on Washington, 1963, I just remembered I saw this recent documentary about the Children's March, and they talked about D-Day, I think it was May 2nd, 1963, but the role that these very young children, I'm talking about grammar school kids, brother Minifu used to always talk about this, and how when the adults had become, you know, they were getting a lot of beat back, and they were coming at them so hard for demonstrating and all of that, and the and they were saying that the movement was feeling a little weary. A uh, brother by the name of James Bevel, I believe, brother many people, right? He began to organize the children. And man, those children were walking out of school. They were being arrested. They spent time in jail. And uh, Bull Connor was holding them down. And I just remembered uh, that Kennedy was getting mad I, from what I was understanding. And, he was talking to, you know, King and these people and saying, well, how dare you use these young children like that? But again, with the television cameras, when all of that was shown and that forced Kennedy to come out and, and to speak and everything, and they were just talking about from what the documentary I was watching, how that really helped to reinvigorate, you know, the movement and, you know, led to 1963, the March on Washington. But we also do know, I mean, the organizing was done at the 16th Street Baptist Church, so. We definitely do know, and those young four girls were blown up later on that it was as a result of that. But I just wanted to add that little bit. That was one of the first projects uh, of the SCLC uh, to form a network of schools. And these were really, re they, they, they had two purposes. Uh, one uh, was uh, to, to, uh, to actually teach kids uh, literacy and, and uh, uh, critical thinking. But the other one was propaganda. You know that and and good propaganda. Propaganda has a bad, it has become a bad word, but it didn't start off that way. All it means is uh, transmitting your world view uh, uh, to other people and, uh, to propagate. And the society, the people who control society with hegemony, uh, are propagandizing in in myriad ways all the time. And so it's incumbent on us uh, to do propaganda. Every, t every chance we get. And that's what the SCLC uh, was doing uh, with kids starting in 1957.
Let's give Brother Ford a big hand. Thank you, man. I think Angie, Angie's going to make a presentation. Come up here, Angie.